Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Fight Chat Friday from TKD Coach Academy. This week we're going to look at the step up from a club level of competition to uh, preparing for an international level of competition and in particular trying out or making a national team and attending national team training for the first time. So if that's something that you'd like to do or something maybe you've recently done, stick with us for this episode and let's see if it's the same as your experience. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Fight Chat Friday. So today's episode is based on a recent national squad session that myself and Adrian were um, were at. Adrian as a national team coach and myself as a club coach um, there to have a look at my own competitors who are trying out for the national team. So there was a couple of things that we noticed and had a, a chat about after the session. So we decided to do a little bit of a, an improv Fight Chat Friday here to yeah. maybe discuss some things that will help people who are trying to make that transition and step from being a club sparer looking to get onto that national team and international level competition. Yeah, because it should be a jump, you know, really and truly. I mean, if, if most of your competition has been at the club level or going to national level tournaments and you're preparing now to step up and compete with the best in the world or the best in Europe, there should be a jump. It shouldn't feel the same. And uh, really, I suppose the idea was, well, let's chat through what are the differences you'll notice and maybe what can you do to help prepare yourself for what uh, for what you should expect when you make that step up and get to that next level. Definitely. Yeah, the, the first thing that sprung to mind for me the minute I arrived was the, the intensity from people who were maybe more experienced compared to those who were just on the scene. Yeah, and the intensity. When I talk about intensity, I mean the the actions per round and almost bringing the fight to their opponent when they were um, doing live rounds. So basically, what, what you see is uh, the guys who were experienced. They they're looking to boss the match essentially, and they're mm -hmm. looking to take control of it in terms of the tempo and the, the ring position, all of these things to to bring the match to their opponent. Whereas I, I noticed the intensity from some people was a little bit uh, lower. And then as a result, they're coming off second best in terms of the timing of their shots and things like that. So um, the actions per round, as well as maybe taking that control over your opponent are two very, very important things. And with the intensity as well, it's it's really about finding a pace in the match at moments that your opponent isn't comfortable with and using that to kind of build up and ramp up your scoring. Mm -hmm. And for me, it kind of came across in terms of like just a sense of momentum. And the way I'd usually find it is you know if, if there's a club level sparring what tends to happen within and around the club is people will go into an engagement and they treat them all almost like they're separate events so as in we go in you throw a shot maybe i throw a counter attack we nod at each other we're like okay that was good let's do the next one and it's almost like it resets to level we move away from the walls or from other opponents and our, our other training partners and and we begin again and whether it's point sparring or continuous sparring it can be much the same whereas when you've landed a score, there's, an, there, there's a change in the flow of the match. And if you can really capitalize that on that and build and go again, if you can put uh, pressure in terms of the ring space, in terms of the uh, forcing your opponent out of the ring or into you know, a warning scenario, or you can just build up the scores, well, why wouldn't you? And the thing is that that's not learned in a relaxed, cooperative kind of club setting. But it is when you step up to this national level, because what happens is, You'll go in, you'll expect that agreeable bounce will just stop here for a second and you yeah. get smashed. The next, you know, the, because the other person doesn't actually agree. And the, the phrase we used when we were talking about this last week is, well, if we're both tired, uh, I can bounce and you can agree to bounce, but we both need to agree to relax the, the tempo. Whereas if I tell, if I kind of show that I'm tired, so I, I kind of, I get my score and I start to just bounce and I, I'm happy here and you just go, nah and you come at me like i have to respond i have to do something about that so you the, the decision is always with you to try and apply a bit more pressure so that intensity i think is a big jump yeah for yeah, sure like that and the, the kind of phrase that springs to mind here is just letting your opponent off the hook and yeah. i think the onus is really on the person who is maybe the the higher level here because if they agree to let you off the hook then the person who is maybe at that lower level it's easy for them to to agree to that whereas uh, it, i think the onus is really on that person to, to bring it to them and you're going to get that reward 
from um, that type of training and as I just threw up in the, the little screen there that was uh, the next one that jumped to mind for me was the ring craft uh, mm -hmm. because it's something that we always have to teach you know right at the start of the campaigns because you'd assume that everybody knows the rules of sparring and everybody knows how everything works and it's going to be fine but the reality is most people don't train in rings it's just yeah. you know a half the clubs don't have mats and the half that do don't lay them out so that there's you know maybe only two or three matches going on in the club at a time in eight by eight or seven by seven rings so because of that an element of the ring craft just isn't developed and one of the things that we would have at our squad sessions is well all of the matches take place on rings all of the training mm -hmm. takes place on rings so immediately you become conscious of well where are the boundaries of the ring who's controlling the center who's at the edge and the second you take away the center and the edge and all those kind of things well in any given situation again it's like we're level again it's like nobody has an advantage in ring position and i think to learn the ring craft to learn where you are in the ring and the, how the pressure changes either a you have to compete an awful lot or b you have to train yeah. in rings and i think again the whole idea of letting your opponent off the hook because i've seen it so many times of people pressure pressuring their opponent towards the edges and then they kind of almost relieve that pressure and leave them come back in yeah and that's doing that's doing the your opponent no service they're not really learning any good skills there likewise you're actually training yourself to get some bad habits there and leave your opponent back into the ring space which is something that we don't want no definitely and it, you know as you said it, it's so much something that you don't want that you'd wonder why it is that the norm is the more cooperative thing but yeah. the, it, it's definitely something that the very 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 second you arrive at national team boom you, you've all of a sudden you've got to deal with this element of ring craft you have to deal with uh better positioning controlling of space and controlling of time and you know those things become really really critical so do expect that if you step up to a, a national team anywhere that once you start doing more of your sparring in a ring you're going to realize just how much you can use that space to pressure your opponent and, and the reason why it's so important as well is because we've actually had a look at this before adrian that people may not be aware but at the very high level internationally it usually will come down to the warnings and that is as a result mostly from the space so yeah. being pressurized to the edges being pressurized where you can't throw shots and you fall over pressurized to a certain space and you kick to the illegal target etc so the space is a massive massive almost like sub variable of the bigger game of sparring yeah uh, and it's something that you have to really get accustomed to very quickly and if you can get that and work it to your favor it's going to be be very very important to have as an attribute in those close matches internationally sure so the next one that we were going to look at is the concept of deliberate practice and mm -hmm. you know i think this was a this is a big step up where um most of the competitors that we'd have seen uh stepping up over the last 15 years whatever it is to, to national team the first few sessions are that finding your place in the hierarchy of things and just sparring to compete, sparring to win, you know, yeah. because you're there. And that changes very, very quickly once you've got a little bit of time and experience and you're you're established at a, as an international competitor, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it kind of goes hand in hand with reflection as well, based on the conversations you've had with your coach or even with yourself from the last session. And um, what are things that are working well for you that you're trying to double down on? And what are things that are maybe things you want to practice and work on in a live environment? Yeah. And you'll see that when I when I was watching the guys at the weekend, it's the it's the guys who've been there, the experienced people who have been champions before. You can see not always. Sometimes they're bringing their A game in certain matches, and then sometimes certain matchups they're trying to use it to work on a skill or double down on a skill they're already good at. Whereas they're not just going out there with the aim of let's just spar and see what happens. They're trying to uh, uh, kind of like almost accomplish certain objectives mm -hmm. based on the training and where they are and where they're trying to develop certain skills. Well, that's it. And what happens then is they go back to their club training. And in the club training, it's uh, reflecting on, OK, well, this is what did work and this is what didn't work from the from the session. Do I need to refine the skill element of it? Do I need to practice it with, you know, in a more representative environment in the club before I bring it back into the, the squad session? Mm -hmm. But typically, the squad session lets us be our most representative. It's the closest that we'll have to competitive sparring. And so what that means is we can take the things that we've done with a lower degree of representativeness in the club that you've maybe worked up from you know pads and cooperative partner training to something that's uh, semi-opposed or opposed and you know is getting more representative but maybe you don't have the quality of opponent within your own club 
to really see if it works under pressure. Then you step up to the national team level and what you have usually for most people, unless you're in the you know the heavyweights or whatever, is you've got people who are bigger than smaller than you, faster than you, uh, have a different skill set, spar off a different leg, you know, all of these different things. They prefer different strategies. And you t don't tend to have that range and that variability within any given club unless it's a monster, it's a huge club. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's something that you can really leverage the, the national team for. Definitely. And I think that kind of links us up to another point that we have as well as the whole idea of kind of um, reflection yeah. and how speaking to teammates and speaking to, and you can even do like self-reflection as well, journal down very simply, like I mentioned earlier, two things that went well, something that you want to work on. And just having that a little bit of accountability each, each session will help you to kind of move forward in the path that you want to go in. But as well, everybody knows when you're in there you don't get the full picture you ever compete and then you watch a video it's like different to what you experienced and um, so that's important as well to have conversations with people to be curious to have conversations this is working for me this is working for you let's kind of have this collaboration and the cooperative environment is very important because everybody's in the same boat here trying to develop themselves and improve so if you can use the the minds that are there and the people that have experience it's going to be very very beneficial and it's just coming in there with a, a learning mindset and a very curious mindset but that is the hard part isn't it because what happens is when you step up for the first time you step up in a defensive mindset and yeah. when you're de and, and it's completely understandable like you're you're already putting yourself out there because you're not sure you belong most people haven't got the sheer confidence to walk into that environment and say no, 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 I belong here. I, you know, I, I own this space. I'm, I'm ready to, you know, to take my throne or whatever. Most people can't do that. So what happens is you arrive there on the, I have something to prove. I've got to, you know, earn my stripes. I have to whatever. And what that does is it puts you in a defensive mindset and then you can't expose yourself. And the, yeah. the, the issue is that to learn most, you need to expose yourself. So you might be finding yourself, you know, walking out of a ring, having taken a bit of a battering going, right what's happened here and you sit down and you don't talk to anyone and you try and figure it out in your own head and you go away and train for a few weeks but it doesn't come to you and someone with a bit more experience will go hey you uh you countered every psychic i threw what what are you seeing like, what am i what am i doing that's giving it away yeah and yeah. they'll tell you oh you always kick to the same length or oh you always drop your front hand when you want to do this or you always lift your front hand before you go for a psychic and we know you're coming and what you'll find then is I was really struck by this watching the Olympics, watching those like speed climbers on the, the bouldering and all that, all that stuff with the climbing. They get a couple of minutes beforehand to try and problem solve and they all help each other to figure out how, how are we going to do it. And then they race. Mm. Whereas what we have is at the end of a match, like the most experienced uh, people are going, OK, I want to be able to do this like so and so or I want to be able to add this to my game or I've been trying this, but it doesn't seem to be working. And they share because they're not afraid of giving anyone like the keys to the kingdom or whatever anymore. They're, they're just willing to be wrong. They're willing to be right. They're willing to share what they have because the better your training group and training environment is, the better everybody is. So I think, yeah, yeah. that reflection, it's not easy, but really, yeah. start. Absolutely. Like a rising tide lifts all boats and you're not going to be competing against all these people that you're training with either. Like 90% no. of the time, no. you're going to be competing against people from other countries internationally. Um, but by improving, everybody improves. So that's the important thing there on the reflection. Don't be, and I think it kind of links into our next point as well of coming there with that challenge mindset, yeah. not being there in a, in, a, in a threat mindset of like fear and kind of being within yourself. It's, it's, it's kind of coming there with um, this idea of embracing challenge and wanting to improve um, and, you know, not going in there with a big ego of um, almost kind of like, being fearful and oh if I lose here I'm the top dog in my club when I come here I don't want to lose it's like one of my students actually spoke to me about this at the weekend is that like she put herself out there against the best people available consistently as often as possible why because she has a limited amount of time there why not put yourself in there against yeah. the best people medals aren't handed out here at the squad sessions it's about you improving and developing for further down the line yeah, and one of the huge relationships you build is with your own squad mates and competitors because what that does, that lasts. That's what helps you get to the next one, the next one, the next one. And the, like, the, you know, the old phrase is iron sharpens iron. And if you can yeah. if you can be one of the irons in that mix, you know, and, and make sure that you're constantly there learning off of the best and becoming the best in doing it, you know, that's really going to help. Mm. Holding back, We've not sharing anything isn't going to get you there. 
definitely and I know we skipped on from the last part we kind of went a bit off topic we'll cover that in a sec the decision yeah. making but um, based on that as well one of the things I was really impressed with, with my own students in particular is the, the honest feedback that they gave me at the end of it whereas you know sometimes people might be a little bit they hold their, their cards closer to their chest and they don't want sure. to reveal everything whereas if you have that communication as a coach with your athletes as well where they are openly honest able to tell you how they truly felt I think that's a massive weapon um, to have both as a competitor and as a coach in terms of relationship because you can kind of get rid of the grey area much quicker and help them to improve faster yeah and you don't always get there and it can take people time to get there but yeah it's a yeah, massive yeah. massive help so yeah we were talking or we were going to talk about the decision making part of it and that that's something that i think very often what happens if you're the big fish in the small pond and you're coming up from your your club level you have an effective plan that has worked for you most of the time and this is really common for someone who's come through blue belt red belt and they've been effective they've been winning their categories then they arrive all of a sudden to this national team thing all of us uh, you know and, and all of a slap they're throwing the shots they normally throw and nothing is working mm-hmm. and i like to call that the end of plan a and <laughs> you realize yeah. like yeah if your plan a is not an unbelievable plan a it usually ends within 15 minutes of the first sparring session at a squad training session simply because people have enough time to look at you and go oh, okay i've seen it all before i know what you're doing okay we'll pick we'll pick this out and uh you know i think that's where the decision making comes in of now you actually have to actively problem solve in the ring because you can't go on autopilot and roll out plan a and that actually is an important lesson because it's one of the most uh, useful skills you will have as a competitor internationally is being Mm -hmm. able to adapt based on the scores that are going up on the live scoreboard based on the, the the match how it's going and like we say time and time again on this channel the two minute rounds of two minutes is sorry the two by two minute rounds uh, are so short that you need to be able to get uh, what's working and double down that very quickly and if it's not working you gotta change quick yeah. because the, the round will go by in a flash and it'll be gone and the time will be up and you'll be at the uh, losing side of the decision you don't want that so adaptability in the moment in the ring if a plan isn't working is one of the most important skills that you will develop and often this is a again it goes a little bit back to the reflective stuff and the deliberate practice but it might often mean that you go in for a match and you realize oh this experienced competitor has picked out my the hole in my plan or they they figured out how to deal with my front leg and you you go to your next opponent you say okay i want you to see if you can figure out what you know what they've done or how they've caught me so what you almost want to do is like give away the uh, all of the information the secret sauce so that Mm. you, you know the people that you're up against at the squads can beat you they can unlock your plan a because now is the time to be losing matches now is the time to be having those kind of um uh, difficulties because you want to challenge yourself with the problems that you're going to face later and i think sometimes people go to these environments and they try to reduce the decision making so much they try to play it so safe that they just do what they always do and what has always worked for them and i think that's such a uh, it's such a wasted opportunity to do that at this level and in this environment Mm, I know, but there there is a, a fine line there as well because it's not about tr- discarding your plan A out and throwing it out the no. window completely. Sometimes it's just a little tweak that's needed. For example, you're using your front leg really well, and somebody is coming through it uh, with their hands. They're countering it really, really well. Maybe it's just a, a case Tidy of maybe tidying up the knee, going at a longer distance, carrying your own front hand a little higher to have an extra mm. line of defense. It's, sometimes it's just small little tweaks like that, but it's all about adapting not just kind of going in robot mode and just repeating the same action over and over again. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think that's something that just kind of gets exposed, but they, they, I think that the five points that we've brought up there all lead to some, the, the potential for someone to feel quite overwhelmed when they get mm. to the end of that first day where the intensity and the building of momentum has caught them off. Their ring craft, they found themselves on the edge of the rings or struggling in terms of their space and having to solve that problem. They're going up against people who are, you know, forcing them to make tougher decisions or to, who are, you know, taking away their game plan and forcing them to act without a plan and be, ref, you know, uh, reflexive rather than, you know, actually acting with a deliberate plan. And, mm. you know, all of these things can make it quite overwhelming and quite difficult to, to get in there. So maybe just knowing you're going to face into that is, you know, half the battle in terms of like being able to then go and tackle it. Well, but luckily, 
everybody has experienced that. Yeah. Everybody. Whether it's being at that squad level or whether it's in the club, the guys that you see that rock onto the squad and, and they, they handle it really well and they almost flown from the beginning, they had to experience it along the way somewhere. Mm, so there was somewhere sure. along the way in the club probably where they weren't the top dog and they had to eat humble pie for a long time. And this is another conversation I had at the weekend with another um, coach on the national team. Every single person has to get that experience of kind of that humble pie for whether it's weeks, months, whatever. But there's nobody yeah. who just rocks on and they're top dog forever. Goes to squads, top dog. Goes to the international competitions, top dog. Everybody has to go through that experience of kind of almost going through the mud, getting Embracing through the trenches. The suck get into this slog and the hard work and yeah. feeling shitty when you leave it's it's about taking the good points working with them and seeing how you can improve um on small areas that you want to get better at think about the the why as well rather than the what it's not really about what worked what didn't work it's about why if you can kind of flip the, the script on that you'll improve much much faster absolutely so i think you know, we'll finish the conversation there, but, you know, for anybody who's thinking of maybe for the World Cup next year or the European Open yep. Cup next year, and they're thinking of going up to that next level, put yourself out there, get to, in, in, you know, increase the size of your training group if you can, train off of tougher opponents, and put yourself in line for these challenges, and it will, you know, serve, you know, serve you no end in terms of improving your game. Mm. Yeah, if you're, if you're not getting smashed, go get fine people that will uh, be beat you up a little bit more. Because if you're just plodding through it, you're, you're not going to really improve as much as other people are. So that that's the secret. For sure. So that's us for this week. And for everybody out there, if you haven't already liked, subscribed and spread the word about the channel, please do get onto that for us. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. And if there are any questions or comments uh, after this, we'd love to tackle those during the week. So please do get active in those comments and we'll certainly get back to you. Until next Tuesday, or next Tuesday, Friday. Let's do Friday. Yeah, catch you in the next one, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Bye now.